Tony, thank you so much for um, agreeing to talk to me today. Um, I think it's about nine o'clock in the morning in Vancouver and it's almost dark here, 5 p.m. in London on a, on a snowy evening. You've got snow as well. So you're a, a research associate with um, Contact North, um, Ontario's Distance Education and Training Network. And uh, I read that you've wrote 11 books in the field of online learning and distance education. Uh, so a few weeks ago, I came across your work um, when you wrote a series of blog posts about online learning in, in the school sector in K-12. And so I'm incredibly grateful to you for, for giving up your, your time to, to share your, your experience, your vast experience of, of online learning. Um, is there, is there, before we get going on the questions, is there anything that you want to um, say by way of kind of background during COVID-19, I, I, I watched with some alarm at what some of the things that were going on in, in our school systems uh, here in Canada, at any rate, and also in the US. Uh, and that prompted me to uh, write that set of blogs because I just felt that, uh, particularly at the administrative level, um, that basically uh, what we learnt over 30 years now of online learning wasn't being a wasn't being taken into consideration in some of the key decisions about what should happen in schools so kicking off with with question one um you've just said that you, you a little bit about kind of the challenges um i know that in your your blog post series you you started by um kind of outlining what you saw as some of the the biggest challenges at um the primary and secondary level so um what, what we call k-12 in the, in the uk could you just say a little bit about what you think are the kind of the key challenges for online learning uh, and obviously we've been going to online learning in an emergency um, situation, but what, what, what do you feel are the, the, the really the biggest challenges? Well, I think there are two two main challenges. One is that uh, there are many aspects of the school situation, uh, especially the younger the the younger the child, that's very hard to rep or, or impossible to uh, handle on online. And I'm thinking particularly of the social aspects of learning. Uh, learning to live with other children outside the family. Um, uh, so there's, there's a limit to what online learning can do. It, it can handle what I would call the academic side of teaching things, but it can't handle all the other things that schools are really important for. And not to mention the fact, of course, that many parents depend on schools so that even during COVID-19, I had work to do and so on. So. So it's much more of a difficult challenge in the K-12 sector than it is in the post-secondary sector because there the students are fairly autonomous in the sense that they they would have been away and looking after their own lives and so on. And uh, you would expect a post-secondary student to take some responsibility for their own learning. So online learning really requires that kind of independence uh, and, and confidence uh, to to in your own abilities to to work and that's going to be very difficult not for all school children but but for some school children it's going to be a particular challenge um, so so the context is, is different and uh, you, you know ideally I would like to see children in schools and not online um, if I was asked that question flat out. At the same time, there are lots of things that online learning could do that could be very valuable in the K-12 sector. So um, the problem with COVID-19 is that it's not a choice that we have. You know, um, it, 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 it's not that online learning is better or replaces face-to-face -face teaching. It's about the only thing we could do to keep some kind of continuity with children's learning. So I understand the reasons for going online. Um, but the second challenge is that um, it's different and you have to teach differently online than you do in a face-to-face -face class. And I can, we can talk a bit more about what those differences are. Um, and that has to be taken into account not only by the teachers, but also by administrators when they're setting up the way in which online learning will be delivered. And so 
moving on to, to my next question and kind of picking up, um, I suppose, what you're saying about the, the differences. Could you, one of your blog posts was uh, looking at, at the curriculum and, um, you know, what, what some people might call kind of learning design. Um, and you you said that we shouldn't be changing the curriculum, but we should be changing our our pedagogy and, and redesigning lessons and, and courses. Could you explain um, some of the recommendations that you made in, in your blog about the curriculum and, and how we change uh, pedagogy and, and, and how we design lessons um, on, online at, uh, at K-12? Yeah, it depends how you define curriculum, of course. Some would include pedagogy as part of the curriculum, but um, I'm thinking of curriculum as terms of uh, learning outcomes and what you're trying to achieve and the subjects that you'd be teaching and so on. And I'm suggesting that we don't need to change that, uh, although we might change our ambition a little during, uh, during a, a pandemic as to what we can actually achieve. Uh, maybe we... I won't say sell our sites lower, but set our sites on on different emphasis when we're putting students online because there are some things that are better done online and some things that aren't so well done online. But the main thing is to change the pedagogy because um, students are working. The, the The prime difference, of course, is that students are working, the children are working individually rather than in a group uh, in a classroom. Now, they might be in a group online, but they're still sort of isolated. They may have their parents around, but they don't have other children. So that that affects the dynamic. And one of the things we've learned from online learning is that you really have to look at that isolation and try to break it down. Um, and that means doing things that you don't have to do in a class because they're naturally all together. Um, so... Uh, some of the things I would focus on is the, again, it depends on how long COVID-19 is going to last. Uh, at one time, we thought it would be over in maybe six months, and we're learning now that that's not going to be the case. It's going to be much longer. Um, but nevertheless, you, you can't do everything you could do in school, so you have to focus on the really important things and I would say that these are developing the foundation skills because if a child loses a year or even more now two years of those foundation skills they're very hard to catch up again um, so the foundation skills of course are reading and writing um, mathem mathematics and so on uh, and good communication skills learning to speak clearly and so on so the focus should be on 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 those and less so on what i would call content you know if, if you have to choose what you're going to focus on then that's one of the areas i think that's really important to work on um and and secondly online learning another big difference between online and face-to-face -face teaching is it can be it's, it's often mainly asynchronous in the sense that the teacher and the student aren't there at the same time. The student can do work on their own, um, but it, that work has to be set. It has to be organised. It has to be um, has to be done. Um, so there will be both synchronous and asynchronous communication. But with online learning, you have to give a lot more thought to the asynchronous activities than you would in class because they're there in front of you and they're doing them while you're there. Whereas online, they're not going to be doing that. Um, the other thing, too, is the time that students spend uh, on, the, on the screen. Um, I, one of the things I, that horrified me, I saw some, some students were, uh, it was like full-time school, they were on, on screen for, you know, six hours a day, and that's not good for not good for anyone to be on screen six hours a day so you have to set work that they can do off screen as well i mean there's lots of things you they can do off screen they can do reading and writing off screen uh, they can do other activities off screen but again you have to really think about what the student should be doing off screen as well as on screen and the other thing is you have to give students lots of activities to do because you have to keep them engaged so a lot of talk to students doesn't doesn't help and um, particularly the younger ones that they, they need to be doing things so that means 
uh, lots of engaging activities um, when they're working at home. And if they're going to do those activities, they've really got to have some kind of deadline for doing them um, and some kind of feedback on that. Now, you don't have to give feedback on every activity the child does, but they need to know that you're, 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 you're going to be asking them about what they've done and they're going to have to show what they've done. So uh, they need feedback and they need a structure. In other words, uh, now one of the things that, that again, we, we're looking at the difference between a digital age and an industrial age here. Schools are really a product of the industrial age. If you think about it, they're very much like factories, you know. They all go to school at the same time. They leave at the same time. Uh, they're, they're broken up into uh, classes at set times and so on. Well, uh, digital learning is much more flexible than that. Students can learn at different times um, and, and so on. So uh, you have to think about that, that, that students are um, going to be working offline and then you have to find a time to either bring them back all together or have a, a deadline when they can get the work in. So if you think about the students day how many hours do you want them studying rather than how many uh, 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 having them at a set time at a set place every day so so again what's a, what's a reasonable amount of work for a child to do um particularly if they're doing it on their own compared with uh, a, a normal classroom time and so i think we need to i won't say be less ambitious but not try to do everything that we would do in a classroom situation because we have to allow students time to do stuff on their own um, and the other thing is the online presence of the teacher um, again if students are doing work offline and then coming back and maybe uh, reporting what they've done and that needn't necessarily be just uh, using a keyboard they can maybe even uh, record something from their phone and say this is what I did and, and so on but the student that must know the teacher is going to see see that work so the teacher will need to rearrange their work so they're not doing all the presentation all the time so they have time themselves to give feedback and look at individual students work because they're not looking at everybody together at the same time now they're looking at maybe 30 different pieces of work so again, you've got to be very careful about your own time as a teacher and how you're going to manage that. But the good thing about online learning is that if whatever students do on their computers, it leaves a trace. You, you've got a record of it. So if they do a, a little little phone uh, video, um, and that should be stored on hopefully you have a learning management system or a virtual learning environment so you can see what the students have done um, uh, they create the work as they go so if you're doing assessment you can do continuous assessment rather than having to wait till the end of the, the course and just do one big test at the end and lots of problems with that because how do you know they're not cheating cheating so if they're do, if you're working do it you're doing authentic work through through the course it's much easier to assess that and it's uh, you, you don't have this problem of having cameras to watch the students aren't going into the toilet to cheat and so on you know which is really intrusive so again you have to change your assessment method as well so those are some of the examples of you know the need to change the approach to teaching but you're not going away from the main curriculum objectives here you're still wanting to get that development of their reading, learning, uh, reading skills, their uh, communication skills and so on. So all those things you're still trying to do, but you have to do them differently. You talked about um, online presence and teacher presence there. Um, it's something we've been quite interested in, in the work that we've been doing with schools and drawing on the, the, the work of um, colleagues of yours, um, Garrison and, and Anderson. Could you say a little bit about uh, the importance of teacher presence online and, and, and what we can do as educators to, to enhance that, uh, that teacher presence when we're making that change from the classroom to online. Yeah, yes, um, I think there's two things here that in the work of uh, Garrison and uh, Anderson. It, it, one is teacher presence 
and the other is um, a community of inquiry. It's the getting the students to work together online uh, to tackle tasks or problems and so on. So th there's two things here. One is, a, is the is if you like the social presence of students online that, that's really important to work at to make sure that they feel that they're still working with other students even though they're physically separated so um so that's equally important but they also found that probably the most important thing in getting students to succeed online is that they feel that the instructor is there for them all the time and that they um they're aware of the uh, the teacher's presence, and that can be done in all kinds of ways. So, for instance, one way and it, that enables you to do both social and teacher presence is to set up some kind of online discussion forum. Now, I, I, there are lots of ways of doing that. You, uh, increasingly, people are using social media to do that, but I have some concerns about privacy issues with using social media. So if you have a virtual learning environment, there's usually a space in there for setting topics for discussion or, or, or setting group work and then organizing the students in small groups of four or five. Um, and they can work in their own group, uh, do some work and then post it back into the main discussion forum. And you can see the work that they're doing. So the way you would you wouldn't respond to every comment that they make or every bit of work they do, but you would basically keep a chart, if you like, of each student and make sure that at some point during the week you, you've referred to the work that that student has done. So they feel that you're aware of what they're doing and you're interested in it. And, you know, and simple things like if they haven't done any work for a week, just, just send them an email and ask or or even phone them and say, you know, what's the problem here? Why haven't you done any work? Are you finding it difficult or are you sick or something? Just just so they know that you're there and caring for them, that makes a huge difference. Now, I think most teachers would do that normally anyway, to some extent, but you, you have to work at it online and you have to really check, again, you know, in a way, it's a, some, sometimes it's easier than in class. When I was teaching in class, I, I remember when I first started teaching, I was very aware that certain children were demanding all my time and other children in the class weren't getting any. And I actually recorded, um, actually went to the bother of recording how much time I was spending with each child. And then the next term I tried to change that and I recorded that and I found it made absolutely no difference. Even though I was aware that other children were not getting as much time from me, the pressure of the child of the other children was such that I I couldn't control that very well. Now, in in, in online learning, it's much easier to do that because uh, you you can see exactly what your interactions are with each child, and you can see when you're not interacting with other children. So you don't have to record it; it's recorded automatically in the online activities. So again, that's a really powerful tool for a teacher to see. Um, you know, how am I spreading my time? I, am I giving children as much equal treatment as possible? Um, and of course, some children will need more time than others, but they may not be the ones you can always <laughs> get to in, in a class. And that was what I f was finding frustrating um, with some of the children who really needed more of my time that, I, that weren't getting it. And I think that's, again, teacher presence is really critical online. And you have to work explicitly at doing that. It doesn't come naturally. You have to check what you're doing and make sure that all the children are getting a response of some kind. So um, another another key difference, of course, with uh, with, with online uh, remote remote learning from home is the, the involvement of parents. So parents are, are having to take on a role as, as a sort of educator and facilitator and, and, and supporter to, to their children. Could you say a little bit about that? Because I know one of your blog posts was specifically about the role of parents and how kind of teachers and school systems can support the parents to support their children. Yeah, well, I think one of the things that hasn't been clear in certainly in some of our school systems is what the role of parents is supposed to be. Um, and so the first thing that's needed is some clarification and some expectations set for the parents themselves. Um, 
and again, I don't have a, I, I have my own views on this, but probably more important than what my views are on this is the fact that there should be a guide for parents if their students are studying at home online. What is your role and what is the expected role of the parent? And clarification of that, because I think a lot of parents were very confused about what they should be doing. Um, and my own view is that they shouldn't be teaching the children. That's not their job. That's the teacher's job. But they do need to provide uh, what I will call a supportive learning environment at home. So, for instance, making sure they get up in time on a regular basis, that they sit down and have a time for studying, uh, making sure that they have a place to study that's not always interrupted um, by other members of the family, for instance, so that they've got a quiet place to, to, to do their work, that they make sure the students get enough, uh, the children get breaks and do something different in the breaks, and, but get back to work again. Um, and often parents won't be able to do that because they themselves are busy. So there has to be some structure put in for the children. So from the from the teacher side, so the children know what they're supposed to be doing at what times and so on. Um, but there should be some flexibility here because, I, 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 again, we could talk about this, but uh, there, there's some issues here with access to equipment and so on particularly if there's only one computer in the household, for instance. Um, so again, there has to be some flexibility that if the parent's working from home and the child needs the computer as well, do they get an extra computer or do they get an iPad and so on? So again, the parent's responsibility is to make sure the children have the right environment at home to do this, their studying. And yeah, they should talk to their children about what the work is to be done and they should encourage students, their children to ask questions of them, but they shouldn't do the teaching. And if students have a question about not understanding something, then it's best for the parent to direct the student to ask the teacher rather than try to answer it themselves, even though they may perfectly well know the answer, but you really don't want to break that link between teacher and student. You don't want the parent coming in the middle and something often giving what might be confusing advice to the child because they're getting two different versions of the same thing. And so it, it, I think it's really important that um, parents aren't expected to teach and that they, they're, they're clear that their role is mainly to um, provide the environment in which the students learn in a regular, sustained way, and also to make sure that the student is communicating back to the teacher. Now, of course, if if that breaks down, then it's perfectly reasonable for the teacher, for the parent to contact the teacher themselves. But generally, the communication should be through the child to the teacher if possible. And you, you talked there um, a little bit about the environment. Um, you've also written in your blog series about creating um, a kind of culture in the learning environment online. Could you expand upon that a little bit more about what, what, what you mean by the kind of the culture within the online learning environment? Um, yeah, I, I did some research in England. I actually went around 50 different comprehensive schools back in the, when they were first set up in the 1960s. And um, when I walked into a school, I could sense the culture almost immediately. So little things like whether the kids ran around in the corridors or whether they walked in straight lines or the amount of noise as you went into a school, uh, the way the teachers informally talked to kids as they walked around the school and so on. And I became very clear that although comprehensive schools were meant to be created equal, you know, and to have all, all kids of all abilities, Different schools have very, very different cultures, and particularly that came from what the, what they were originally, whether they were a grammar school or a secondary modern school and so on. And this really affected the atmosphere in the school and how students worked. And what happens, of course, is a school builds up a history of its culture. You know, it's, it inherits a culture and it continues and so on. Now, when I went to study teaching online, I realized you, you're going into a, what I would call a culture-free zone at the moment. You know, when, first time anybody's been in this, it's, uh, there's no culture there. You have to create some kind of 
uh, overall culture and cultures can be good or bad uh, here in uh, Canada we had a terrible culture in our residential schools for indigenous people um, destroyed it destroyed families it destroyed individuals um, it tried to uh, create a kind of colonial uh, mindset in the students which just didn't you know just wasn't appropriate so culture can be bad or good now when i when you're teaching online then it's really to some extent up to the teacher as to what kind of culture they want to create in their classes online but you you really have to work at it so so for instance uh, I, I prefer generally collaboration over competition in my group so I, I like students to try to help each other out i also want them to be respectful of each other so i watch the kind of tone and the language that they use when they're in when they're online and so on um so i set some rules basically at the beginning i set a set of clear rules that here are some do's and don'ts in my classroom um and you, you know, I think some teachers do that in, in a face-to-face -face classroom as well, but I think it's particularly important online because if you think of the student, they're in there individually and they can flame very easily. They can send a nasty comment to somebody and they're not going to get punched on the nose because they're actually somewhere else. Um, so you really have to watch the culture within the, and it can get out of hand very quickly, particularly I would say, you know, in certain, uh, say, around 11 or 12 or 13 year olds, it can, it can start to deteriorate if you're not very careful. Um, so I, I, I lay down some fairly strict ground rules about online behavior and what they can and can't do. But I also have a set of values that I'm trying to get over in the teaching. And again, I make them explicit. Um, so, so, for instance, um, if I'm trying to build a sense of community in the class, I'll ask them to do a little blog on, on themselves, um, you know, who, who they are, because, again, they may know each other previously, but often when you put them in an online group, they don't know each other. So they can just say a little bit about what their favorites favorite pastimes or activities are and so on just just 100 100 words 200 words nothing big uh but put it up and then the, the whole class can see each other um what, what what who they are and maybe put a photo and so on um so it, it, it's it's important to create that culture in and you have to work at it to do that and uh but i think it's very important because if i can get a really good feeling of community and working together i get much more out of the students than if they're all just working on their own for instance now again the values you choose for that culture is up to you as a teacher but i think you should be very clear about what kind of culture or values you want in and how you want students to communicate and uh, relate to one another in, online and the older they get the more important i think that becomes that it's very clear that that there are certain things that you're not going to accept in the class and other things are really important that they should do picking up on um the the, the difference in, in in age age and stage um i know that you've written about um your experience of working in kind of post-secondary HE, but also contrasting that with the kind of K-12 um, primary and, and secondary school level. Could you say a little bit about what those differences are? I mean, obviously, you know, child child development at different, different ages, but there are some key differences um, in how things are set up um, at university or kind of post-secondary level and, and at school level. Could you say a little bit about um, your thinking about that? Well, I, let, let's start with the youngest age group. You know, they, I, I, the, the younger the child, the less appropriate online learning is for them um, for all kinds of reasons. Some are purely what I would call psychological and developmental. You don't want very young children spending too much time on a screen. They need to be doing other kind of activities um, like play and so on, which is very important. Um, they can't always do it with other children, but they, you, you know, they need that kind of 
social and um, non-academic activities as part of the developmental pro pro process. So, um, so some of it. So the, the the younger you get, the more difficult it becomes. Um, and I, I I don't want to overgeneralize here because I know certainly some some older children who much prefer actually online learning than going to school. They are that they they they're people who are often considered introverts, um, which again is a bit of a generalization. But they they like to be on their own. They like to control their own learning. They they enjoy the freedom. But these tend to be older children. They tend to be you know, 14 or 15, um, it, it's much harder for a younger child to have that uh, management, self-management of their time in a responsible way. So they do need much more supervision and guidance, um, either from the parent or from the teacher. Uh, and it's, that gets harder and harder the younger they get. So in, in a sense, if I was having to make a decision about what kinds of... Uh, safety procedures to take in schools um, I would make sure it's the the younger children who get access to the school rather than the older children for instance because I think the older children will manage better online than the younger ones so if you're trying to spread them out in the school you know you just a space issue then you know that's a pro I, I would look at the younger children I would also look at in some of the older children the ones that don't have um, very good home conditions for study. If they've got, uh, say, multi-generational uh, um, families living in the same home, so they've got about eight or nine people living in the same same house, or they're in in a very poor uh, accommodation, they don't have good internet access, for instance. Then those children should get priority in going to school. So. It's those things that you have to consider more in, in the school system than you do in the post-secondary system. You would expect most students in the post-secondary to have access to a computer. I mean, it's really, if you're going to university now, you know, you'd be expected to have a computer. We wouldn't expect the, the university to provide the computer. But that you, you can't assume that in the school system. So... So there are, you know, th those are some of the some of the issues that are really different, and I think you have to give a lot more technical support at the K to twelve level too. You you would expect a student to know how to keyboard and how to log in and so on. And you actually, if they don't know how to do that, then you you really have to give them help in the school system to do that. So it has to be part of the part of the teaching is getting them up and running on on, on their computers and. Students will vary enormously in their ability to do this. Some will probably be way ahead of the teacher, even at seven or eight years old, and others, you know, 14 won't be familiar with using a keyboard. So, <clears throat> so there, there, there are all kinds of differences there. You, there a lot of assumptions you, we can make in post-secondary education just don't hold in, in the K-12 sector, in the school sector. Finally, you know, we've, we've had this nearly a year now of um, schools across the world um, having the, the move to, to distance learning, to online learning, and also mixture of kind of blended learning in and out of, of school. Um, and that's been approached by different governments, municipalities, regions, school boards in different ways. Um, I know that your final... Um, post in your blog series was actually some advice for decision makers about remote um, or distance distance learning, online learning. Could you say a little bit about um, what you think the key things are for decision makers and kind of, I suppose, like sort of school leaders at, at, at those different levels? Well, I think every school board or certainly every ministry should have somebody who is an expert on online learning when decisions are being made about online learning um and that clearly wasn't the case in many school boards in north america uh decisions may have been made by the, by I, I i i mean we hear all the time that politicians saying i'm deferring 
to our health experts in what we do with COVID-19 and so on. Never heard one ever say we're deferring to our experts about how we're going to deliver programs into schools during a pandemic. Um, you know, there's, as I said, there's 30 years of experience of what works and what doesn't. And so making decisions about what kind of delivery you're going to have of online learning without talking to somebody who knows something about it. You know, it's like asking somebody to fly a plane without being trained as a pilot. Um, you wouldn't expect that. So why would you expect to make decisions about online learning without having somebody who knows something about it, who can sit at the table when these decisions are being made? Now, I can quite understand them being overruled by the health people and saying, no, I'll you know, we cannot have them in school. And you may say it's better for them to be in school, but we, we can't have them in school. That's fair enough. But very often they weren't even at the table, never mind uh, not being listened to. So, so I think every, every school board now needs an expert in online learning who can advise on what's appropriate and what isn't, not only during COVID-19, but after, because what we're finding is quite a lot of things can be done online, even for quite young children, as long as it's part of a broader context, which includes on-campus um, school-based teaching. So, um, and it, it, in the K-12 system, it's, it, it's really difficult to know exactly how to change the curriculum and the approach to online, depending on the age of the child. You can't have one solution fits all. Uh, from from uh, six years old up to 18. You've got to have different solutions for different age levels um, and different different subject areas even. Some things work better in some subjects online than, than others, for instance. So you need somebody who's got that overall ex expertise who can provide advice to government about decision-making here. And that will apply after COVID-19 as well, I think. Before COVID-19, we had one provincial government here who, who wanted um, all the, what, that they will be 16 to 18 year old students in schools to take four online courses, for instance. Um, they would have to take four online courses. The reason they were doing that is they thought it would be cheaper than um, it would save government money. Well, you know, if anybody had been if they'd have consulted an online expert, the online expert would have said, well, it's not going to save you money because it's just as much work as it is, you know, and you, you can't have larger classes just because it's online because a lot of online teaching depends on what we talked about with teacher presence. And if you cut down the teacher presence, the students will fail. Is that what you want? You need somebody who can talk to government like that. Um, so that's one thing. The second is that, uh, I was somewhat shocked to find that in some school systems, there was no standard uh, technology that teachers could use for online learning. There was no virtual learning environment and, and teachers were going into Zoom or whatever they could find on, on the internet for delivering their teaching. So again, you, and again, this is a problem particularly if students have more than one teacher. If different teachers are choosing different platforms, then the students are going to be really confused. So, again, having uh, a system-wide, uh, well-technically-supported, uh, um, I would say two things. One would be a virtual learning environment, and it doesn't matter to me which one, but some are better than others, but they all work pretty well. Um, and that's really essential because not all students can get Zoom. Uh, Zoom is, takes three times the bandwidth of um, video conferencing takes three, at least three times the bandwidth of a learning management system. And even if they've got reasonable internet access into the home, if you've got four people on four different devices and you, uh, one of them's streaming video, video games, and then the other student is trying to get uh, Zoom lectures, then it doesn't work very well. You, so you need asynchronous learning. Um, and and really the, the basis for the course should be on the learning management system. You can in integrate Zoom, but it should be just one of the tools that you integrate into the learning management system. So 
So again, some kind of standard uh, across the system would be important. The third, of course, is teacher training. Um, teachers, it's not rocket science teaching online, but you probably need about 10 hours of basic training to teach well online. Um, you, you, could, you could do a lot more, but, but a minimum of 10 hours. And it's a bit late to wait till the pandemic for that to happen. So one of the things that we should be doing is looking at, are we embedding some teaching of, and some online teaching, how to teach online into our uh, Bachelor of Ed programs for trainee teachers? And are we making sure that we have enough teachers in our system who know how to teach online if we have to go into an emergency to teach online? So we, you would have, some teachers who teach all the time online and others who would be able to switch online in an emergency and, and be able to do it well. And I, I've complained, one of the things that bothers me is that having, trying to teach with a group of students in front of you and another group online at the same time. Again, we come back to that <clears throat> question of who gets the attention. It's always the ones in the class who will get the attention and the ones who are online Will, no matter how skilled the teacher is, will feel that they're second best. And so, again, you really want it. Maybe if you're going to have a parallel system where half the kids come in to school and the other half are online, you need different teachers for, for each of those sections, not trying to get the one teacher to do the same. It's also impossible for workload. It's, it's a terrible, if you've got 30 kids and you've got 15 in front of you and 15 online, it's just just unmanageable, basically. It's, it's like managing a much larger class, for instance. So, yeah, and there will be teachers who will do it quite well, I know. But you, you can't base it on exceptional teachers. You have to have a system that will work, that all teachers can cope with. So, again, you, 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 so th 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 that, that's another issue, that we, we need more teachers who have some basic background in online teaching and know how to do it properly. Tony, thank you so much for um sharing your your experience and your 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 wisdom um about, about online learning um that's been really really helpful